turn to the book of Revelation, chapter number 2. We welcome any of our online friends that are able to chime in with us as we have been journeying through the study in the seven churches of Asia Minor. We've looked at uh, the church at Ephesus. We've learned some things that the Lord has spoken to them. The church at Smyrna, the church at uh, Pergamos, and the church of Thyatira. We believe these are seven little churches there. And if you look at the outline, you can see the kind of the area where they're located, kind of near the coastal area in that Turkey section. And they're actually, they are on a mail route. That's why that you can find those cities that served as a mail route. And so the church we're going to be looking at, Sardis, was a, a church also on that mail route. If you look at your map a little bit closer, you will see that the next two churches that we'll be looking at, the church in Philadelphia and the church of Laodicea are also on that geographical area. Just some things about Sardis in general from a historic standpoint. It is in Asia Minor, current day Turkey. It was the capital of the ancient kingdom of Lydia. It was home to the well-known temple of Artemis and it held to the pagan culture of their time. And the city of Sardis was synonymous with money because they believed it was the place, first place that money was created in the form of gold. And you may have heard everything uh, the, given the Midas touch well, there's stories about that from that particular area. Very wealthy area to the point that we believe spiritually it became their downfall. They began to trust in the things of this world more than in God. We're not sure who started this church, but it was not too long, 30 years after our Savior was crucified, buried, and rose again, that this church began to have some real issues. Uh, Sardis was a town about 50 miles east of Smyrna, 30 miles southeast of Thyatira, and it became part of the Roman Empire in 129 BC. Paganism flourished in Sardis. And you can only imagine if you're trying to start a church in an area that is dark spiritually, this particular church was in an area where there was darkness spiritually. But thank God for those that had received the message but it struggled. It had its testing. It had its challenges. And to be able to continue to live for Christ, uh, being faithful to the Lord would require a definite decision. So if you have your Bible tonight, turn to Revelation chapter number three. And God has something to say to us through all of these churches, not only during their time as the letters were written by uh, we were saved through the inspiration of God's Spirit. And has God given the letters to the individual churches? Notice in verse 1, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis. Let me pause right there because I haven't made this mention. Here the angel is not talking about an angelic angel. It's talking about the messenger. Who will be the angel here? This will be like the, the pastor of the church. So you could say, you know, some people say that is the is the is the pastor an angel? <laughs> Here's a biblical context about this idea that the reference is given to the leader, and that we would say that that pastor. Right, these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. And be watchful, strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard. Hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief and come. Thou shalt not know that what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white. For they are worthy he that overcometh. The same shall be clothed in white garment. Raymond, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Verse 6, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And so far in our study of the churches of Asia Minor, there has been one church the Lord did not have a rebuke. Remember what that church was? 
It was the church of Smyrna. They were the persecuted church. Also, you got to remember, if, if we studied this, that all these churches represent a church time frame and age. And, and this particular church, the church of Sardis, it would go through a time where hearts would get renewed and there would be revival. They would come to truth. It, would, it is also known as that reform, that reformation period. So as we look in the church of Sardis, what does the Lord have to say to this church? And, and it would do well for us to take heed to listen to what the Lord has to say to the churches, plural, because not only Chart, Sardis would get the letter, they would circulate eventually, and all the churches would understand what God is saying to them. So before we go any further, let's ask the Lord's help at this time. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray for Holy Spirit guidance in our lives. We thank you that you love the church so much that you gave yourself for it. But we understand, Lord, there is always room for spiritual growth. And we pray that, Lord, that you would guide us down the study of your word. Speak to our hearts, challenge us. Help that one that may not know you as Savior to receive you before it's eternally too late. And we'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. We find the church of Sardis facing a very difficult thing. Some have referred to this particular church as the dead church. Why? Because in verse number uh, one, we find towards the latter end, and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name that livest and art dead. Now, when you read the Bible, the word dead could mean physically dead, like your body and how that body will decay. But we also know in the, in the spiritual sense, our relationship to God, if, if we are not saved, if we are not born again, we are dead spiritually. So you have to say this, if you know anything about any congregation, no matter what size, there are both saved and there are lost. And we are all born into this world. We are given life by the Creator God. But we believe that it's by a spiritual birth that we enter into the kingdom of God. There are people that claim to be saved. There are people that claim to be Christians that show no fruits of the Holy Spirit, no concern, no desire. They have no interest in spiritual things. Every town has a reputation, including this one. They had a name, John says, but they were dead. Spiritually, Paul told us in Ephesians tells us this in Ephesians 2, 1, and you have he quickened, that means give life, who were dead in trespasses and sins. In Ephesians 2, 5, he goes on to say again, even when we were dead in sins, have quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. So even in those two statements, Paul is acknowledging a spiritual condition of deadness. So Paul, just like John is indicating, there's something about the condition of man. And in this case, John is referring, as God has led him to write this letter, there were some people in that church, whatever name they carried, but spiritually speaking, they were not born again. They were not saved. And Paul reminds us, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Colossians tells us this in Colossians 2, verse 13, you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Now, why is this an issue? Why does God uh, deal with this? Because it's a very important. Everybody that ought to be coming to a house of worship, ultimately God's desire is that nobody perish but that all should come to repentance. Would you agree with that? God doesn't want us just to go through the motions. You know, I could bring my dogs, uh, ghost and bell to the service. I could probably have them sit down, give them water and dog food, and, and you'd be surprised. They might even carry a Bible if I let them or put something around their body. But just, just because you come to a building like this or any worship building doesn't mean you're a Christian, right? 
That's my point. And there were lots of people in the city of Sardis that held wealth and involved because Artemis, that idolatrous worship, there were people that were of religious be beliefs, and somehow they had become slack, you might say, and allow leadership, allow things to be taught, and allow different conversations, so much that it affected the church of Sardis that perhaps they had teachers in their church, Sunday school teachers, you might say in our vernacular, that were not saved, that were teaching the word of God. There are men in the world that claim to be pastors and stand behind pulpits of the world that have never been born again. They are religious. And likewise, there are people in pews that fill up pews and benches and chairs throughout the whole world that have never been born again. And there are different fruits that you can spot out as you examine. Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them. And so I'm thankful for those of you that are here tonight and you want to grow in grace and you, you want to know more about the Word of God and what the Lord Jesus has to say to the churches. You get excited, especially when you think about the Word of God. And, and what about someone that does not get excited about the Word of God? There might be a big question mark among that person's life, but maybe they're going through the formalities. Maybe they're going through the motions. They want to know God, but in their hearts, they know they are far from God. So the Lord tells them, what's wrong with this church? They are dead. And thou has a name that thou livest and art dead. The second thing he mentions is the beginning of that, or it's right in the middle of that verse. He says, I know thy works. I know thy works. Now, their works were something that was significant. Notice in verse 2, he says, be watchful. And strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. So this idea of works, what is he talking about? He's talking about whatever they were involved doing, uh, Jesus tells us to let our light so shine before men. We are to learn to live the life that God has given to us. That is a, a life that's yielded to the truth of the word of God, the spirit of God. And to be able to minister to others. Somehow, somewhere in their thinking, they thought they had done enough. The expression not perfect means in that latter part of the, I have not found thy works perfect before God means incomplete. Signifies the fact that God has something in mind for them to do. God has a lane and, and God can only cause you and I to walk and to run that lane and to finish well. Maybe they became complacent. I've learned that there, there is always room for spiritual growth. We should always be open to what God wants us to do. And where does the Lord want to change in my life? What does God want to do in my life? And in this church, unfortunately, there were some things that were play, taking place in their hearts and minds that God had a message for them. So when I look at this uh, church here, what would, what would you say is going on? Did the riches of Sardis infantry, did the doctrine of maybe men that were not saved, the concern, the urgency for men to understand there's a need of salvation, or were they of this persuasion, get all you can and sit on the can? The reality is that no matter if you're rich or poor, anywhere in between, the Bible tells us, to boast not thyself, for, for thou knowest not what may be on the morrow. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. So this is, a, this is a group of people, and some of them are not spiritually alive in Christ. Some of them are lost. A lot of them maybe said a prayer. Maybe they went through the motions. But the Lord says they're dead. Then some of their works, they, they maybe they threw the towel, maybe they got discouraged, or, or maybe they said, let somebody, let somebody else do it. There could be on all kinds of sufficient re reasons out there. I don't know about you, but I, I get tired physically. <laughs> it takes concentration just to be able to study the Word of God and read the Word of God. I could come up here and just read the Bible, and that will be it. But we... As Christians, I think we are called to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing 
the word of truth. Does that make any sense? So you have to put some energy, some focus on it. So what is God's remedy? What does Jesus have to say to this congregation at the church at Sardis? To our church, to the churches around, or maybe to a Christian that's in trouble. Some have regarded this as steps to, spirit, to spiritual renewal. Well, first of all, I just don't want to make this complicated because we don't have a whole lot of time. Number one, we need to wake up. In verse number two, it says, be watchful. That means stay alert. Take note of what's going on before you. You know, it's very interesting. I, I told my wife uh, uh, yesterday, I want to take the car to go get, get the tires rotated and balanced. If you have driven a car and owned a car, you understand that wheels can get out of balance and they can get out of balance pretty abruptly and also very subtly, slowly over time. And I think spiritually, they had allowed some things in their midst that were outright wrong and, and they entertained it. And, and ideas go through three phases. First of all, bad ideas go through rejection, toleration, and then acceptance. It's kind of like if you ever went swimming and you're kind of afraid and maybe shocked that the water was cold. What do you do? You, you dip your toes in the water, right? And then you get in a little bit more, a little bit more, and eventually you emerge yourself. Spiritually, that's what we can do. We need to be alert. We need to be watchful. The devil never takes a break, and you and I need to keep our hearts with all diligence. Now, how is it that they could stay alert? How is it that they could be watchful? How is it they could be more awake? Well, Paul, the apostle, speaking to true Christians, said this in 1 Thessalonians 5, in verse 5, Ye are all the children of light and the children of, of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep or as do others, but let us watch and be sober. First Peter 1, Peter wrote this, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I find this very interesting that when I was in high school, if you use a lot of profanity, the doctors, the nurses, the policemen, your teachers, your mom and dad didn't want any kind of that language. During an elementary, the same thing. And today, fast forward it, many years later, I still think profanity spoken in very vulgar ways is still wrong. It's not helpful. But what's happened to our culture? Even what's happened to some believers, if we tolerate bad language and, and cursing and swearing constantly, I can tell you one of the things that changed in my life was my language, dragging Jesus' name through the mud and saying, God, this and Jesus did. I'm not saying I'm perfect, I arrived, but I'm simply saying that in part, it's our thinking. Maybe the church of Sardis got lazy. They weren't sober-minded and begin to allow some stinking thinking in their thought life. I remember uh, working at Russell Security in my Bible college days. I was right in the, in the middle of two jobs and I just got hired by Napa Automotive Parts and I was working for um, Russell Security. So the place where I was working was, uh, was at a condominium and it had like a 10 stores hub. My job was to be able to show up at six o'clock and be there till six in the morning. And um, I remember uh, just being stressed this particular day and having very little sleep. And uh, that, that particular pay period, I wanted to buy me a pizza all to myself. And so I bought me a pizza, ordered it, and on all my break, they had a swimming pool with nice lounge cushion chairs like, like we have here. And so I ate the pizza and I laid down and I made a mistake. And I did not wake up till almost five o'clock in the morning. You say, what did you do? I quit that job. I said, it ain't worth doing it. I better go ahead and sign up and take the job at Napa Automotive. And I'm glad I did. 
I'm just sharing that spiritually speaking, we must be alert. We must be awake. Uh, the third Sunday in January, the world celebrates the world religion on the third Sunday in January. You might be surprised by this. There are over 4,000 recognized religions in the world. But according to Jesus, there's only two. You are either on the broad road, the broad road to destruction, or you're on the narrow way. If you're on the narrow way, you must believe in him. You must trust in him as Savior. The heartbeat of Jesus, he wanted people to know him, to trust in him, that they could believe in him and know that their faith was in the right person. Jesus said this in Luke 19, 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. This was also the heartbeat of the Apostle Paul, who said this, For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. 1 Corinthians 2, 2. So if we are going to do what Jesus says for us, for our personal life, be watchful. People you have encounters with, talk to them. If the Lord opens up that door, share the truth, share the love of Jesus Christ. Now, I wish to God I can say I, every person I've met, when given the opportunity, I do that. I want to say that I do that, but it doesn't always happen. But yesterday was a perfect example that it did happen. Went into Albuquerque, we needed some eggs, and and that was it was such a strange thing. I, we usually go to Costco to get this, if not Walmart. Costco, you can get a whole bunch of the so-called organic eggs, but yesterday they were completely out. And uh, they said uh, there's something going in, in our country in the agriculture part uh, department, and, and you can that's another sermon in itself. But as I was headed back, I, I saw one of the employees and, at Costco. They have uh, freebies they give away. She was giving away these little, little flattened-out pretzels, and uh, so I, I grabbed one of the little containers and I just kind of looked at the lady and said, thank you. And I said, how are you doing? And we struck up conversation and that led to one thing to another and come to find out she was saved, amen? Come to find out that she had a sister that she had just lost in December. And so I told her we'd be praying for her and uh, pray for Teresa. Also pray for God's guidance as she's witnessing to her own sister that's in rehab. And so I'm just saying that to say God allows us life and, and we are to let our light so shine before men, whether it be in word or whether it be in deed. Last Wednesday, thank God for your giving hearts. Thank God for those of you. And uh, we've challenged people over the years. They've had various needs and various things that have come, whether it were not for food and water and electric bills and rents and gasoline, all sorts of crises had happened to people. But last week, as we uh, saw with our very eyes, those of you that had compassion on a man that had no need, uh, that may have been the most powerful sermon that he had seen in a while. And so continue to let your light so shine. Be awake, be alert. Don't allow any wickedness in your life. And, and this is very important for all of us as believers. Number two, not only wake up, we would say be watchful, be careful, be alert, but shape up. Look at verse two. Strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. The people that give a lot of time, the so-called expertise in the physical realm, the physical exercise people say that muscle tone is very important. That if you don't use it, you will what? Lose it. You will lose it. That goes for me and that goes for everybody. So when I, was, when I think about what the Lord is telling the church here at Sardis, he's telling them to strengthen the things that remain, which tells us there was some good going on of the church of Sardis. We're not told how many. We're not told uh, what was gain, being done, but okay, what do Christians do? Let's use this for example. Uh, you're here tonight. This is our Bible study and prayer time. You believe in prayer, and so maybe one of the things that was waning, maybe the, one of the things that was dying was their prayer time. There was uh, a point in time in the history of our nation concerning Bible believing churches when Prayer was very important to God. Now it's entertainment. Now it's music. Now it's all recreation. And, 
And the, the Word of God in some churches, especially prayer time, is a very difficult thing to be able to do. Maybe we need to resolve to strengthen the things we used to do for God. I mentioned about the cleaning list. Uh, we always had a need for that. We need to pray for workers, that God will raise up Sunday school workers to teach to young children, uh, to help babysitters to get on board, to whatever we do to, for the glory of God. I'm always encouraged when, when you do it, when you bring goodies here, we have a little bit of fellowship. We can break bread together. I love those potlucks. Amen. Amen. We're due for one, by the way. <laughs> but listen to what Jesus said in John 9, 4. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. Think about this. There will come a time. I pray you'll be able to use your time, your talent, your treasures for the kingdom of God. But you might deal with something that will affect your thinking like... Uh, uh, the people that deal with all sorts of memory loss. Uh, they, physically, you might get to the point where you cannot walk. Every time I go into Walmart and see people with uh, the motorized vehicles, one of my kids showed me a picture the other day on his on their Instagram account where this guy is coming out of a, a store and, and he's got his motorized vehicle. He's got a shirt and tie and everything on, fluorescent green, and then he's got either his grandkid uh, with another uh, one of those things that people, strollers that they can sit on, and he's pulling him outside of the store. I thought, that's pretty cool, you know. Whatever it is we do for God, strengthen the things that, that we might be able to go forward for the Lord. And then thirdly, clean up. So we have wake up, that is be alert, be watchful, strengthen the things that remain, uh, whatever we're trying to do for God, uh, the first love for our relationship, and out of that bearing fruit, living for God. Then thirdly, thirdly it's uh, clean up. Verse 3, remember, wherefore thou hast received and heard, and hold fast, and repent. How should you live your life as a Christian? How should you live your life as a believer? I think the important thing here that I would say John, especially we've been studying in the Gospel of John, is the Lord promised the believers that he was going to depart, but he was sent, what, to them, to help them, the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God is something that we receive the moment of our salvation. This is so very important. Maybe they had gone to the point that they were not relying on the presence of of the Holy Spirit of God living inside of them. You can quench the Holy Spirit of God. You can grieve the Holy Spirit of God. But the Bible reminds us, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit of God. It's a continual dependence upon God. Paul said this in Galatians 5.25, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Maybe they forgot the teachings of the Spirit of God and the things they have heard, the, the apostles' doctrine, how about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and Him crucified and Him buried and rising on the third day and that He will come back again. Sometimes when we're down and discouraged, one of the greatest things that we could do as believers is reflect upon the time. Remember that time you got born again. Remember that time you heard the gospel. Remember that moment of your conversion, how God worked in your life and, and you saw yourself as a sinner and you recognized that Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life and you placed your faith and trust in him and he saved your soul. And all of a sudden you begin to understand there was a change going on. You didn't quite understand it completely. Paul says it like this. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. What became new in your life? I'll tell you what. You were dead in trespasses and sins. And when you trusted in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit did a work in your heart. Now you become a recipient of the Holy Spirit of God. Now you are a new person in the Lord Jesus Christ. Doesn't mean your hair's changed. Doesn't mean your face has changed necessarily. You might have a little bit more glee, but the inside of you, that real you, has now been born again. God wants us to trust in Him through the Spirit of God, 
But I also find here in this passage, and I'm going to end quickly here. He says, hold fast. Hold fast to what? Hold fast to the word of God. Hold fast to the promises of God. You know, I'm thankful that if I should ever find myself in a spiritual jam, we have a promise from the word of God in Proverbs 28, verse 13. It says, he that covered his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. How you live your Christian life and how you yield to what you live for will make a big impact in your life. If you're yielded to the Holy Spirit, if you obey the word of God and listen to what Jesus says, you will have a victorious life, an overcomer life, you might say, as John even mentions here. What would you think if I wrote my wife a letter, and not just one, but two, and she never read it? And vice versa, what if, what if my wife Trisha wrote me a letter, and you found out I never read them? You would say, don't you love your wife? Yeah, and might say, yeah, I love her, but you don't love her enough to read her letters? Well, there are many professing Christians throughout the world, and I hope this is not true of you. If you name the name of Christ, do you know the Lord? Do you read his word? Do you meditate upon his word? Like, a lot of people like to sing the songs, standing on the promises of God. But in order to stand and believe the promises of God, we must read the promises of God. We must obey the promises of God. It was really encouraging on uh, Monday to hear of someone's testimony about how they have a Bible reading calendar and how they try to go through the Word of God throughout the year. And in my heart, I was thinking this, faith comes, comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So the Lord tells them to remember Remember how you have heard and received and hold fast and repent. We take that word repent, a change of mind and heart. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Sardis had been uh, taken over by the enemies twice because they were not alert. The Lord has said he will come upon the earth, even upon the some who are not ready. And yes, we may have heard, maybe you have heard, others may have heard, that you Christians say that Jesus is coming back, and just like they said in Peter's day, where is the sign of thy coming? When is the Lord? The Lord's not here yet. Well, he may not be here, but we are closer than when we first believed. And all God's people can say, amen, amen to that. He is a coming, and he will come like a thief. Unnoticed, and you better be aware, you better be ready to receive the Lord. In conclusion, we find the Lord has promised for those that have not defiled the garments. In verse 4, he says, Thou hast a few names, even as artists, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father, before his angels. When you look in church history, in history in general, there was something about wearing the white at weddings, at various coronations and this was a sense of honor that God's people would be clothed in white garments signifying victory that we are overcom overcomers because of the Lord Jesus Christ and on top of that God says he will not blot out your name out of his book of life and I would say the Lamb's book of life would signify the fact that my faith has been in Jesus and that I'm eternally secure because of the presence of his Holy Spirit unsealed unto the day of redemption. But there were some that were not living for God. There were some that were not living for God because they knew not God. They were dead spiritually and they needed to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. If there's any doubt in your heart and mind that you need a Savior, can I tell you, Christ will save whosoever will. Christ will forgive any sin. He's, he's, he died on the cross and shed his blood to pay for all sin, past, present, and future, so that we can have a relationship, a right relationship with the God who made us and gave us life. The church of Sardis, some have said, was a dead church. Thank God for those that had life.
So God reminds them, strengthen the things. Be watchful, be awake. Strengthen the things. Uh, shape up and then clean up. How am I going to live my life? I need to live it by the power of the Spirit of God and through holding fast to the promises of God. Oh, we could go a whole lot longer with that. We're going to go to prayer right here. We're glad you're here tonight.